Namaskara. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you're listening to this, and welcome to this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik. I'm back after a one-week introduction hiatus, so let's go. The guest this week is Hazik Ali Chaudhary. Hazik and I met each other at the University of Central Oklahoma and have now known each other for close to two years. Uh, in that time, I've worked with him uh, in a student council and I've had a ton of conversations that were quite in depth, which resulted in me wanting to bring him on this podcast. Um, in this episode, we spoke about topics like uh, strategic communications as a major, since that's what he's currently studying at the university. We also spoke about some of the hurdles that we face in communication, um, things like comfort zone and how there's a certain set of challenges that we have to sort of get over those. India-Pakistan relationships, since that's quite a hot topic and he's Pakistani and I'm Indian, and horse riding, and so much more. Um, yeah, that that is a wide range of topics, and I think it's those different facets of our lives that makes us unique. So, without further ado, I present to you Hazik Ali Chaudhary on this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik. Hey, Hazik, how's it going? Thank you so much, Pratik. It's awesome. I'm glad to be speaking with you from Lahore, Pakistan right now. <laughs> I'm glad to Welcome. have you from there. I'm glad to have you from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we can work it out three continents apart, you know. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess that's the beauty of the internet, right? Like, you can connect with people wherever you are, which is beautiful. It is. I hope the connection stays the same way throughout the conversation. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Anyway, to kick things off, I'd like for you to introduce yourself to the listeners and the watchers. And I've, this is sort of the trend that I've been keeping with the four people I've interviewed before. <laughs> so I'd like for you to introduce yourself like you would to a random stranger uh, mm-hmm. if you were to bump into them on, a, on the street or something and mention some of your likes and dislikes as a person. And can be anything as mundane as you know, not liking laundry, you know? So whatever you feel to share. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, my full name is Hazik Ali Chaudhary. I'm uh, from Islamabad, Pakistan. Currently, I'm studying at the University of Central Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. I'm a student of strategic communication. And strategic communication, a lot of people ask what this is. It's mostly about public relations, media relations. It has a, a little bit uh, of journalism in there. So that's what I'm studying. I'm in my final year right now. Uh, besides that, in my personal life, I'm a big fan of horses. That's one thing I like. Or I'd say like is an understatement. I love horses. <laughs> Maybe you can tell, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell, yes. Yeah. So, and I like coffee. I like mm. it a lot. I think that's my fuel to keep it running for the day. Mm. And it's not any fancy coffee. It's just black coffee with ice. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, for my dislikes, uh, I think it keeps changing from time to time. <laughs> One day I dislike something, the other day I dislike another thing. So mm-hmm. uh, I can't say for sure what I dislike right now, but I think since I've come back and I haven't driven on the local roads for so long, I think I dislike the traffic right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Traffic. Yeah, for sure. I think when you see people lining up in the roads over here, they're like, Oh man, there's so much. This is rush hour traffic. I'm like, what are you talking about? What traffic is this? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. back home, we've seen a lot worse, right? In terms of traffic. So it just, when you hear people saying, oh, this is rush hour traffic, it'll probably take us an extra 15 minutes to get there. Like, nice. what are you talking about? But I guess that's the differences that we live in in this world, which makes it all interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, so just to kick things off, uh, you said you you study strategic communications, um, and you mentioned sort of the brief idea of what it's yes. what it's about. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you what what got you into studying strategic communications? Was it something that was it an experience, or was it just a sort of curiosity? Speak to me a little bit more about that. Sure, I'll give you a honest answers nothing got me into studying strategic communication okay it was just the fact that uh, i was studying business administration before. Mm-hmm. yeah 
I was studying business administration before. I took a few classes and I absolutely did not like it. So I went to my advisor and asked them if there's something else that I can opt for. Mm -hmm. uh, so they asked me about my likes and dislikes, my preferences. They recommended me this major. I took a few classes into that and I really understood and realized that this is something that I can really move forward into. It's, it's something that aligns with my uh, personality and uh, my goals in life. So mm -hmm. that's how I got into strategic communication. It was by a total accident, but I'm loving it. That's good. That's good. That's good. What was it about business that got you away from I it, guess if you don't mind my asking? I'm sorry, you were saying something? What? What is it? I was just asking, what was it about I was about saying all business? good things. That have... Please go ahead. All good things in life. All good things that have happened to me have happened without, uh, without any important planning you know it's always a coincidence i run into those things and then i start to like them and then i stick with them that's how i take major decisions of my life but you were asking something about business what was that oh i was just asking uh, what was it about business that sort of got you away from it was there anything specific about business or was it just the fact that it was just not something you vibed with i think it was too much theory um mm studying economy, uh, studying theories of business administration and stuff. And I, I hate, absolutely hate writing, even though I still write, but this is yeah. a different kind of writing, uh, analyzing market trends and everything. And uh, I just think that was not me, mm. you know, memorizing all these terms, keeping up with all these tr uh, trends in the market. That was not me. So that's how I moved into business. And I think, uh, I was really lazy to put effort into studying all those concepts that my teacher would hand out to me. Mm -hmm. It was binders this thick and I was like, no, this intimidates me. So... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like it more hands on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. And you mentioned something about how uh, you feel like a lot of major decisions in your life have sort of been a product of coincidence and, you not knowing how it'll go, but then you end up liking it. I think that's that's how life is, right? Like when you get into something, you're not sure how it's going to go, but then you later on find out that you like doing what you're doing at the moment. So yeah, I, I just think it's it's that sort of, I don't know if this is the right word, but serendipity, maybe, uh, where you sort of just walk into something and that ends up becoming something you like. And I think that's, that's the beautiful part about life. Um, but yeah, moving into the depths of strategic communication, you said that sort of aligns with your goals. Uh, if you're willing to share, what are some of your future goals? What is something that you see Hazik down the road or Hazik doing down the road? Uh, that's a tough question because uh, if I had enough planning in my life, I wouldn't be running into coincidences to find out eventually what I'm supposed to be doing. But I'll tell you one thing and... Uh, something that I'm passionate about, and that is uh, taking things from good to great, which mm -hmm. means if I find something, it's standing at an average level. I'd love to put my effort into it, be it anything and improve it and bring it to the next level. And I call it taking it from good to great. I think with strategic communication, it's somehow the same impact that you're leaving on the companies that you're working with, that when you start with them, they might not be at a very, uh, at a level where they, they could be easily recognized by the other people in the market. But when you imply your strategic communication major, uh, the principles that you've learned into that, uh, you slowly build a brand. Mm -hmm. Slowly people start to recognize what you're doing. You get your message out in the public. And uh, eventually that turns the reputation of your com company, hence uh, its value in the market right. to a new level. And I think that is what I'm interested in, whether I work for my, uh, whether I work for my own family, whether I work in a different company, whether I work in one country or another, I think uh, this would always be useful skill, taking things from good to great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something about like everything that we do, right, is you want to make sure that you scale up and, and you grow from the things that you learn and sort of make it better. Uh, for you personally, based off of some of the, please go ahead. You were going to say something. I, I could maybe disagree with that. On, on okay. Some do you want to, do you want to expand on that? 
Sure, based on some of the teams, some of the organizations that I've worked with, I've been working with teams for past six years. I think uh, growth is a, is a challenging process. Not everybody is open to growth. Uh, mm. Not everybody has the vision or the potential to see uh, the growth that they could achieve. And it requires some really uh, tough perspective changes. And not everybody is ready for that. And so I think sometimes people are really stuck in the, their own comfort zone. They're hesitant to get out of it. And so uh, while it is something that everybody wants in their life, aspires in their life, I think it's really hard that they take the necessary steps towards achieving that growth in their life. So mm -hmm. that's where sometimes we run into difficulties. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to transition into asking that question about the difficulties yeah. of going from good to great. And you answered, yeah. you read my mind, you answered the question. I was just going to, yeah. I was just going to add on to that. Um, why do you think that is like, why do you think people are hesitant to change? Like you said, the comfort zone and all those kind of things, but um, should, like knowing that the end goal is going to be growth, shouldn't yeah. we as humans sort of be open to being like, okay, I'm willing to take this plunge and sort of see what will happen. Because I think at the end of this, if I try it, maybe I might become better. Uh, do you think it's just a fear of failure? Or what, what is it from your own perspective yeah, that you think stops people from sort of taking that plunge? Um, that's a very uh, deep question. I'd say it has a lot of different perspectives to it. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be in a position where I'm judging someone, uh, but based on my my your own interactions with people so far i think everybody grows from my own perspective i think everybody has grown up in a different environment everybody has been brought up in a different uh setting uh right. everybody grows up learning things that they their parents have taught them their own mm -hmm. principles their own outlook at life and mm -hmm. when that happens uh you know i remember a quote from my friend he, he said uh, it's not his quote, but he said, a boat is uh, safest in its harbor, but that's not where it's where it belongs. It belongs out in the sea, sailing out there. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, the, the important question over here is why are people not willing to step out of their comfort zone? Mm -hmm. uh, for one, they never felt the need to do so. And if they never felt the need to do so, it's maybe because there was nobody around them to inspire them to see something bigger than what lies in their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have no motivation to get out of it, you cannot get them out of it. Mm -hmm. Number two, if they do have the motivation to get out of it, sometimes, as I mentioned, everybody grows up in a different background. Everybody grows up with their own strengths and weaknesses. And those weaknesses, I think, constitute to some personal insecurities within people, uh, which even if they want to grow, uh, as a big barrier for them to overcome. And that is where the personal, uh, personal growth comes in because it has to start with the mindset first. And uh, some people, whenever they want to take that step, they're reminded of their own weaknesses. And if there's no proper mentor or guidance or a different mindset or perspective thrown at them, they might not be able to see the necessary steps to move out of that comfort zone in, in, in order to grow. Mm. Uh, that's one of my uh, analysis on this situation. You know, I think everybody wants to move out of it, but there is a, you know, this fog even today in Lahore, uh, and some people cannot really see out of that fog. Mm. Somebody has to come show them around. Mm. And then uh, I hate to say it, but there are some people who think they're just the best. Mm. They're just they're just really good at what they do, uh, yeah. which is not true. There's always going to be somebody who's going to be better than you. Uh, I mean, in a very open conversation, sometimes people can be uh, really arrogant of themselves. They don't know. They think whatever they do is a, a top, top notch. Mm -hmm. So, so if somebody else comes in and tells them that, Hey, maybe this is how we can do it better. Yeah. I think that strikes, that strikes their own ego and they just don't want to get they just don't want to walk past that. So that also sometimes acts as a barrier for them to be able to uh, take those necessary steps to change certain uh, certain course in their life, you know. Mm. That I could go a lot deeper in that, but I think I've touched the base of it. These are a few mm -hmm. fundamental issues that we need to look at. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's yeah, like you said, it's that problem of people being married to their own ideas and their own sort of uh, belief systems and principles that, that they're possibly not willing to open up and see the other side or see what else could be done. Um, that is I mean, so true. You've perfectly summed it up. Yeah, and I think uh, it's it's it happens to all of us. I think we're all uh, we're all perpetrators in that sense. Um, yeah. I've I've struggled with that. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'll be honest. I've struggled with that, but at least I'm so happy that I have the potential to see out of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not there instantly rejecting an idea. I do assess its merits, mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be right or wrong. There's no concept of right or wrong. It's just whether it aligns with my preferences, with my goals, or not. Mm-hmm. Then to adopt or not is the question. Mm-hmm. Do you think the concept of right and wrong is very subjective? Uh, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about, sure. in this case, in this scenario, if you were to consider like working with a group where you're trying to get from good to great, do you yes. think like aspects of right and wrong can be very subjective in that scenario? They can be very subjective. The only thing where it's not subjective is where where principles are challenged and principles are timeless. They never change. Right. I'll give you a very basic example. Being on it, honesty is a virtue. It's a principle. It's timeless. Three centuries ago, it was the same principle. Today, it's the same principle. Mm-hmm. Now, the methods that you put into the market to implement your uh, your ideas and goals, they keep changing. They keep changing every day, depending on the scale of the company that you're working with. They keep changing every month. The market trends. I just look at the the example of COVID, the way it has right. hit market, everything has changed so quickly. Yeah. I think the, the way you do something is very subjective and it should be subjective because otherwise, uh, if you number one thing that keeps these companies growing is their adaptability. Right. That is very subjective, but the principles remain the same. Now, how do we determine what are the right principles that work with our, our things? It is that if you're working in a team, of people. I think there's a difference between a group of people working together. There's a difference between a team. A group of people are just working together. Uh, they're bunched together. But a team is a group of people working towards a common goal. Mm-hmm. So I think once you highlight that goal, once you specify that goal of yours, then anything that you need to do to achieve that goal is something that should be and now you can have you can have eight people in a room and eight people would give you different perspectives about how to achieve that goal so now you have to look at the merits of each argument and you have to see which of them is the most efficient way to get you closer to your goal so i think it's very subjective in that regard Mm. but the principles remain the same you want growth you have to be willing to be able to get that growth out Mm -hmm. yep i agree 100 percent. i think um it can be it can be very easy to sort of like we talked about previously it's very easy to stay where you are because you like what's happening around you but then when your views are challenged it sort of yeah. it becomes very difficult for us to tolerate that uh do you have if you're willing to share do you have any personal experiences where you sort of experienced this issue where maybe you've had trouble coming out of the thought process that you had and you said you sort of have the ability to sort of see out of it and come out of it if you can remember these situations or scenarios, what was that thing that got you out of it? If you're willing to share. I mean, what you've asked me right now is something that has happened too often in my life. So mm. it's really hard for me to remember a specific instance where okay. we would have to be challenged. But uh, if there was something that you learned from all of them. It was something that I've learned from all of them is to is to really let someone be themselves. Mm. And I think that only happens when you truly accept yourself as who you are. Unless you're not accepting yourself as who you are, you wouldn't really understand how to accept someone as who they they are with their views and with their own uh, perspectives in life. Mm. Um, and so that is very important. So every day I struggle with the fact that uh, you know, it's really, it's a slippery slope. It's hard to fall into that perfectionism mindset mm-hmm. where, you know, you're just trying to achieve something greater every day. You know, you're working, you're working yourself out 
or sometimes even you're tiring yourself out towards trying to achieve something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is, at some point, you have to take a deep breath and accept yourself for who you are. You know, this is who you are. There's a potential for growth, mm -hmm. but make peace with yourself. Right. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, accepting others' beliefs or just taking a look at them is a whole different spectrum of this conversation. It starts, the very first part of the spectrum starts with your own personal self. And I think for me, the biggest learning was to accept yourself as who you are and be yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree 100% because I think if you're secure with what you believe in, I think it can definitely yeah. help you in sort of putting your point, point forward and also yes. possibly seeing where the other person might be, where, be, where the other person might be coming from. Um, exactly, yes. Yeah, so like based no. on, please go ahead. If, if you put an analogy to this, they say, if you can't love yourself, you cannot love anybody else. You know? mm -hmm. And that's up. Mm -hmm. For sure, 100%, I agree. Um, based off of your time studying strategic communications, uh, if there's a few things, like maybe three to five things that you've learned to sort of overcome this barrier, what do you think those things are? Um, I think I didn't understand your question. If you could just repeat it some other way. Sure, sure. Yeah. So basically, you've been studying strategic communications as your major. So yeah. if you've learned a few things, maybe like five things, like five major key points, major points that you've learned that you feel could help bridge this gap of uh, differences in understanding, what could those or what are those five things that you've learned? Number one use your commas and periods wisely. <laughs> <laughs> Just understand where to put that semicolon and okay. where to use that column. I mm -hmm. think it really helps. If you're writing me an email, mm -hmm. I can really clearly understand what your point is. Mm -hmm. Be to the point, be very strategic in getting your message across. You know, I think that's very important. But um, one thing I'd say is uh, listen to understand, not to respond. That's very important. We always in our strategic communication major, our point is to get the point across in the shortest amount of words possible and be as direct as possible. Get the message out to the right audience. Mm -hmm. You know, that can never happen if you don't understand who your audience is. Mm -hmm. And you have to really understand who your audience is. So as much as there's speaking out there, getting your point across, it's more about listening, understanding what your audience wants, because they're always at the center of your communication, understanding what the other person is really here for today. Mm -hmm. What are they expecting from me? What, what, what do they want from me? What are their goals? What are their preferences? And even if I have a writing style that's very different from theirs, I'd adjust my writing style to their writing style, you know. So let's say you have to write a press release. The press release you're going to, in my in my area of study, the press release that you're going to write for a non-profit organization is going to be very different from a press release that you're going to write for a government organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so it all depends on your audience. And it, right. it really helps if you try to understand who your audience is, listen to them. What are they mm -hmm. expecting from you? What are, the, what are they looking forward to? So listen. Uh, to understand not to respond mm -hmm. and then after that obviously use your commas wisely <laughs> <laughs> fair enough i think it's very easy to sort of be misdirected by the way that we use commas and um periods like you said because it's yeah. very like whenever like it's it's a daily thing that happens like for example if a friend texts you something yeah. and um when you read it, you're like, what is this person trying to say? Like, because it's very hard to sort of read the underlying emotion when it's just in words. Um, mm -hmm. So for you as a person, like you said, those commas and like periods very much are, are very much important and sort of maybe helping the actual emotion sort of come out. Uh, for you, like what, what are some of the challenges that you think happen like or that are a part of daily communication? Like when... For example, if you are texting your friend, um, hmm. what are some of the challenges that you feel are, um, you know, common that you feel like the other person is not necessarily understanding what you're saying 
even though mm. from your end you feel like you've sort of put it out the way you can put it out what are some of the challenges you've experienced with that from on a day to day basis yeah well i think uh, number one i think it's very important to put it out there mm. uh not every every meeting has to be a meeting it could just be an email <laughs> we have <to. laughs> uh yeah. covid has taught that to us very well oh yeah and number two uh not every email has to be an email it could be a 5 minute phone conversation that makes things a lot clearer mm-hmm. what happens is it depends on the intensity of the message that you're relaying across and then it is also depending upon the length of the message that is going mm. so let's if the message that i'm trying to relate to you has a lot of emotions in packed in there I think texting is not an appropriate way to relay that message to you. I think a 5 minute phone conversation would make it easy. If not there are many different ways to leave a voice note, just leave mm-hmm. a message for that. You know, but I don't think that necessarily writing a two page email to clarify your stance on a certain particular <laughs> issue be the right way to go for it because yeah. I'll tell you what happens when the reader reads uh-huh. your uh, two page email or let's see even if it's one page or it even happens in texting you know sometimes mm. people would send the long messages the thing is and we do it ourselves too would read the top would read the bottom or would read some of the most important pieces that highlight in our own brain you know mm. and just go off with that and would sort of uh, make our own assumption of the tone of the message okay this is what it is and then since it's just a whole long message it does not have any strategic points in it you just don't know which point to respond to mm-hmm. it just gets very difficult to you know like if if let's say i'm sending you an email it's like i have following questions from you number 1 this is the question number 2 this is my question mm-hmm. and then when you're responding to that email it happens okay for your question number 1 this is my response for your question number 2 but in texting you you're sending a whole paragraph you know and then you're just confused what to respond to you know it's a whole mix of emotions so i think that's one of the challenges i've really come across mm-hmm. in uh, in my texting and i think uh, i wasn't mindful of the business hours before <laughs> uh, that is also one thing you should know and uh, mm-hmm. now especially with the time difference uh, right now when we were speaking i think we have an 11 hour time difference it's evening at your place and it's um, just early morning here mm-hmm. it's it's very important to be mindful Uh, different times of the day uh really have a different impact on the mood of the reader mm-hmm. and it really affects how the reader is going to respond to your messages that you've relayed to them mm-hmm. uh i'll tell you the marketing strategy of uh, a food chain in oklahoma mm-hmm. um there are they're a burger food chain so you know every time and they have a breakfast menu so all the ads that they put out on their mm-hmm. facebook uh-huh they put it around 9 o'clock in the morning mm. they put it around 9 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning so they know that at this time reader is going to look at their facebook they're going to be hungry they're probably going to want to choose where to go for lunch mm-hmm. and breakfast and that's where they see this ad and it would have an impact on them so you see that's how it's right. very minute details but it it's when strategically thinking about it really has a big effect mm-hmm. yeah. yeah like advertisements for that matter they're just a passing thought you're not necessarily thinking about uh the sort of messaging behind it or like what they're necessarily trying to t- trigger but like you yeah. said when you just mentioned that breakfast ad that some burger food chain puts out you're like oh i need to go grab something to eat even if it doesn't get you to go to that place it's still triggering you to go and get something to eat so it's in that But sense it's very strategic not yes. going to trigger you it's not going to trigger you if i put that ad out 4 o'clock in the day mm. you know in the afternoon it's not going to trigger you right 11 a.m. 9 a.m. yes mm-hmm. it has a very direct impact mm mm-hmm. mm mm-hmm. I mean I guess triggers could be different for everybody because I think for some people it could just be it could just be oh I'm just hungry I haven't eat, eaten anything yet maybe I should go and grab something from the grocery store or something you know I mean again I think that can yeah. I think the trigger can possibly be uh subjective but anyway I guess that's a deeper yeah, I think yeah, it depends on the audience so it's very important to study who your audience is and I'm guessing that you are a very a man with a big appetite oh yeah 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I make no bones about it. <laughs> no bones about it. Uh but um speaking of strategic communications um yes. I mean depending on how comfortable you will you you are talking about this. Mm-hmm. Uh um <laughs> now I'm from India and you're from Pakistan. Um I know it's it's well known. <laughs> Say that again. I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. I know where you're headed. So I think you're about to uh, I I think I know where you're headed. I think you're about to ask me how much money do you make in this career? Are you <laughs> No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask um I mean it's it's a hot topic to talk about but um I feel like there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding in terms of like how um the relations between the two countries are dealt with. Uh I don't want to go to I don't want to get this topic into a political conversation necessarily but mm-hmm. what do you think what do you think some things are that we on both sides uh or maybe from your perspective on that side of the of that part of the world do you see could be done better to sort of strategically connect better with the other mm-hmm. side wow i absolutely love this question it's way off than what i was thinking because you know when you said <laughs> Indian South Asian you know if i'm explaining this to my dad my dad would be obviously like okay i don't care what you're studying tell me how much money you're going to make in that <laughs> so that's what i was thinking i thought this is where the question is going to go but this is a very beautiful question i think the relations of india and pakistan indo pak relations uh, uh i've always been involved in the current affairs uh, uh, activism in my own country where i'm living currently studying my university so i'm always open to this uh, discussion um one thing we all have to understand is that this is not an easy conversation it's a hard conversation 100%. that's why it triggers a lot of emotions mm-hmm. when people start to have this uh, debate but i think uh, uh an effective conversation about this would be all, the only way to put the emotions out and put the logics in you know mm. uh pakistan and uh, india have mainly uh, just a few disputes among them and one of them is obviously kashmir mm-hmm. the second one is the water dispute the third one is the uh i won't say it's a dispute but it's a you know a, a head to head competition and that's the nuclear arms race right uh, and the arms race in general in general correct and uh, i think the biggest trigger of that because this uh, these two nations have fought what now about four wars if we consider kargil as one of them too mm-hmm. so uh what's important is uh, what do the people of both the nations want right i think at both both sides of the border i think the people are not interested in further wars the people are not interested in more spending on defense budget we have more priorities like healthcare and education uh but then we come back to the same concepts of uh, strategic communication or just media in general uh, one theory that i'd like to put it out there it's called the agenda setting theory the agenda setting theory in uh, media or uh, strategic communication is that uh, even though the media is not going to tell you uh, it's not going to control the way you're thinking it is definitely going to guide you towards what to think about mm. so now when we look at the news outlets in both countries i pick up the indian newspapers the indian news channels and i would pick up the pakistani news articles and the channels i think all they have portrayed in the minds of people is that and with the strategic words used conflict right number one word used conflict animosity uh disagreements Mm-hmm. political discourse i think when you're feeding your nation off of these words it's somehow from a childhood of 8 8 years old to now when i'm 23 it's definitely going to have an impact on the mindset of not just one person but an entire nation correct right i agree and that's another challenge uh i think if i had not gone out of pakistan and i had not stayed in a country which is neutral and which analyzes both perspectives i would not have been able to grow out of it mm-hmm. i would have had s- still some sort of biased stance towards uh the dispute the three disputes 
main disputes that these both nations are facing right now. Uh, but the thing is, now I assess both of these situations neutrally. Mm -hmm. And I think it's as responsible, I cannot say what the politicians need to do, but I think what as responsible citizens we need to do is we need to analyze our news very carefully. Mm -hmm. And we need to analyze uh, all the information that we are feeding in from our friends, colleagues, or politicians very carefully. What kind of message are they trying to give us out? Are the they trying WhatsApp to say forward? The WhatsApp forwards, yeah, you know, the, literally it's a whole factory of propaganda. Oh yeah, 100%. So it's really important for us to be able to uh, differentiate the news from uh, fragments. That is very important. And then the other important part is to be able to analyze things properly and to see where the, what the main problem is. I think uh, let's talk with the Kashmir uh, issue, you know. Mm -hmm the main problem is not the it was it's not the conflict between the two two nations it's the it's the importance of the recognition of that part of land and pakistan and india have been on two completely different pages on that uh, pakistan as for pakistan the narrative it is uh, narrative is that it is still a disputed territory as for india it is their own constitutional matter so how do you bring these two people together when they're on completely two different pages and so mm. it's uh, very hard uh, it requires difficult conversations but uh, diplomatically speaking both our nations right now they're not interested uh, into bringing that conversation back in Mm -hmm. And why they're not interested is a whole different debate because of in my analysis, I think it's because both the parties are at their completely own political agendas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really difficult to move forward like this unless the people of the nation come forward and decide it's time to change the old narratives that we've been right. taught. In. Yeah. 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 No, I agree 100%. There's a few things that you mentioned that are very important to sort of understand when it comes yeah. to sort of analyzing this issue or any other issue or any other sort of conflict that the media portrays in the world. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're aware of this person by the name of uh, Naval Ravikant. Uh, he's an angel investor and he's someone who's really active on Twitter and things. And I remember listening to uh, one of his, uh, he was a guest on uh, the Joe Rogan Experience um, right. And he, I remember him talking about uh, media and like sort of the thought processes and um, all those kind of things. And um, it's very important to note that, like you said, the the things that are put out in media, the things that we see on WhatsApp forwards or like whatever it is, they mm -hmm. have the ability to sort of direct you to think a certain way, which... Mm -hmm is very dangerous, especially when it comes to a dispute like this, you know, because yes. you're not necessarily seeing what's happening on the other side, you're just feeding into what someone is telling you. And without yeah. that being fact checked, it's so easy mm -hmm. for us to sort of fall into that, um, fall into that sort of fake notion or false notion that, oh, yeah, everybody on that side is bad, you know, it's, it's something that I personally still find very hard to understand as to why can't people be more um, or why can't people zoom out from that and sort of see the entire issue so from your perspective do you think it's that sort of sense of comfort of that sense of being in the comfort zone and things like that which sort of avoid people from zooming out and looking at the bigger picture or what is it in your um, in your opinion that sort of doesn't make people uh, want to zoom out and look at the bigger picture in one sentence, I think it's the fact that we've never been taught the importance of zooming out and looking at the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Growing up, yeah. I was never taught to look at what the, what the other side is. Like, is that a thing, to be very honest? Mm -hmm. And so half of the country thinks it's useless mm -hmm. to really look at the other side. Like, why? What's the point? We know we're right. So again, we come back to the same question, is right or wrong subjective here or not? <laughs> right, right, yeah. So it, yeah. It has to change on a, on, a, on a very small scale at individuals' homes, you know. I think parents have to teach their children to be able to zoom out, look at the other side, give space to others to mm. be able to express themselves. 
And I think that is what we are not willing to do as nations in Pakistan. We think that we have been right throughout in India. They think that they have been right throughout. And uh, that's why the conflict exists because we've never really tried to give each other the space to be able to come on a table and have negotiations. Like in the history of our two nations in 74 years, how many times has, has it been that we have actually come down uh, on a diplomatic table to speak about something? Yeah. Hardly, I can count three or four instances. And that has also always happened after a dispute or a conflict or a major war. Mm -hmm. Like the last agreement that we and Pakistan had was the Shimda agreement. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee uh, did visit Pakistan after that, but it did not lead to any further discussion. So I think we need more of that on diplomatic level, but um, that's not going to happen. It's not like somebody will push you to go do that, I think, on a structural mm -hmm. level that has to happen through a combined policy of not just the diplomats, but the media personnel, but the nation, the educationist in your mm -hmm. country. All of them have to work towards this. Mm -hmm. Because if it, was a, if it was a structural issue in the government, it would have been changed long ago, but it's not. Right. It's, a, it's an issue in the mindset of the people, and that takes time to change. And as we talked about in the very beginning of this podcast, that is a growth mindset, and that is very difficult to achieve because of people's own inabilities to get out of that comfort zone if i if i were to talk to a random person on the street in pakistan and i were to tell them that uh you need to understand what the perspective of the other side of the border is you know the common response to them would be what's the need for that why would you want to say that or i would be labeled a, i would be labeled a traitor yeah that's the easy way to go about it <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah, that's what is easy right fling fling yeah. a name at someone be like, oh yeah, he's a traitor, or oh, he doesn't believe, he's not a patriot, and all and those kind of things. Unfortunately, those voices resonate with the masses, yeah. which is which is really unfortunate, like you said. And uh, yeah, I I do believe that the media has a huge role to play in that because, uh, I mean, like that famous saying, I don't know who said it, but they say that controversy sells, right? Like conflict, <laughs> controversy, all of these things sell in the media. It's that sort of negativity that yes. that the media portrays that sort of pulls you in. Like, um, sure, I think we see positive things in the media where they're like, "Oh, this person got this," and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you don't end up watching the sort of debate that they have about that positive thing, if that even is a thing. Because I don't see people talking about positive thing, positive things on the media. It's usually two-hour-long debates about. What is the problem with Pakistan or what is the problem with India? You know, it's just that sort of peddling of the negative um, emotions that we have towards the other side, which is which is quite unfortunate. And I think we as people could do a lot better to sort of zoom out and look at things. Um, I mean, from a different perspective. And that can I can get you yeah. over here. Yep, sure, go for it. Okay. Uh, where do you, my question number one is where do you get your news from? Mm about the geopolitical geopolitical uh, situations in this region especially south asia mm -hmm. where is it that you get your news from and number two is uh, just in general would you be interested in watching a news that is about parks recreation or uh, would you also prefer to watch something which has a lot of masala in it like a very honest answer what would you be sure. doing in this situation yeah to answer the first question, um, I honestly don't watch the news as much anymore. Neither do I read much about the news anymore, to be brutally honest. Um, I think ever since COVID hit, um, especially due to, I think COVID was one of those things that sort of took me away from the news. Um, yeah. Because especially when it first started uh, to sort of impact the population over here and around the world, I remember watching a lot of videos on YouTube from like different news channels sort of peddling these theories and sort of being like, oh, this person on that side is wrong or, oh, this person on the opposite side is wrong. And that just sort of, it sort of just killed my mood for like two months or so. I was, every day I woke up, I felt very negative. And ever since the, I think ever since May or June, I've yeah. literally stopped watching like any sort of um, news or any sort of uh, uh, videos related to the news so I honestly to be honestly answering your question I haven't kept up with any sort of um, geopolitical news related between it related to India and Pakistan 
uh, mm-hmm. in recent times and to answer your second question um well i think i think like like we said controversy sells right masala yeah. masala sells for those of you yeah. who don't know masala means like spice so like that sort of spicy news that sort of like uh i catch you stuff it sells like that's what pulls you in so for me personally i don't know if i would watch the news uh if it wasn't spicy sure if if i was someone who was still watching the news uh cuz now i can't necessarily answer that question cuz i don't watch the news but if you were to if you were to go back and ask pratik 6 months back and um, or 7 months back for that matter being like would you watch the news if they read something or if they said something about the parks and this and that well i mean i think at the end of the day like the way that these people sell it is what grabs you right so even if something positive is said is sold in a very um a bringing manner i guess it can pull you in right because i think it's all in the branding it's all in the sort of uh it's all in the sort of thumbnail and the sort of title um cuz that i mean that's how negativity sells like when you see a controversial statement it pulls you in there's there's certain things that are like eye candy to us in terms of controversy that sort of pull us in so i i agree with you in the sense that i if if it was just so mundane i probably wouldn't watch it if there was an article title that was just oh this happened today i wouldn't mm. be as inclined to go and open it but yeah. you know if it said something that was masale dar or spicy <laughs> yeah maybe i would yeah. maybe i would i i won't disagree with that but maybe yeah. uh, that maybe that is something that needs to change on my part being uh, in the sense that i should be open to reading uh, things that are aren't necessarily spicy in that sense and are just giving you the truth giving you what is actually happening rather than peddling a sort of uh, peddling this narrative that only aligns with one side instead of giving you multiple sides of the picture so that's something that i think i could do better and i think a lot of us could do better um so yeah does that answer your question i hope i answered your it question it does it does it really does it was yeah. not not it was more of a trying to understand what what the overall situation is then a question but yeah it gives a broader sense to me yeah 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 cuz for me i don't know what it is um but the past seven months uh have mm. just killed me like it killed the killed the need for me to watch the news um right. even after well, even after that happened where i stopped watching like uh videos from cable news channels and things like that mm-hmm. i did sort of keep up by watching some commentators talk about it like for example there's a person called philip de franco i don't know if you're aware uh there's a youtuber by the name of philip de franco who talks a lot about the news he does like mm-hmm. 20 minute episodes every week where or every day i think monday through thursday where he talks about the news and right. sort of talks about the things that are happening around the world and so on and so forth i did keep up with that for a little while uh yeah. but then that got tiring too i was like nope i'm and that <laughs> happened around election time i was like nope i'm not going to watch this stuff too i'm honestly i'm done and i think a part of me or i think there should be awareness because it's important mm-hmm. to sort of know what's happening and uh, if you can contribute to making things better 100% i think there there that needs to be there um right. So from my end maybe it's also about looking for those sources that are giving you the truth rather than like we said peddling a narrative um so yeah maybe maybe there's something that uh, I can look for well, are there any sort of platforms that you follow that you feel are giving you the truth rather than uh, peddling a narrative that you feel like we could all check out it could be international it could be pakistani whatever it is like yeah. do you feel like there are there are certain outlets that people could well, follow i i do get my uh, news from the regular news sources but then i also have to see that the news casters are not the experts on the subject so then mm-hmm. we have to really refer to this experts and you know what they are saying about it so for example india and pakistan if i were to look at something like that i would rather look at someone who uh as an as a neutral commentator on the subject then i would rather go read their articles about the situation i would rather mm-hmm. go read their books on the situation sometimes mm-hmm. i read uh the daily times of india to understand the other side of the story you know mm-hmm. and so scholarly articles uh books and newspapers because they give a complete story about 
and they put, you know, it's very important, they put quotes from these experts in their stories, which you don't see very often in the news. Right. That's how I get my news on the situation. And then, you know, the most important thing, even if you get your news on there, uh, the most important part is to able to, to be able to, uh, you know, attract the emotions of the people. So let's say it's a story about India. I have read it all, but I want to get the, the ground perspective on that. So I would come to you because you would know that situation a lot better. If you were to ask me something about Pakistan, I would be able to relay my emotions to you much better. Although mm -hmm. it's very, it's a very specific type of narrative, but at least it broadens your scope on the information that you've gained. So I think uh, referring to the experts, be it through articles, through books, through their own social media, Twitter and everything, that's very important. For example, I was, uh, you know, I was reading about the uh, Iran nuclear deal uh, with the US that was obviously suspended after Trump administration uh, took charge. But, you know, to really understand the situation, uh, Every news media is giving me a different opinion, but I wanted to see it from the perspective of what the Iranians think about it. So Trita Parsi is, an, is, a, is a very good author, expert on the uh, geopolitical situation in the Middle East. And he has wrote, written a book, it's called uh, Losing an Enemy. And it gives a very detailed analysis of, okay, if Iran is perceived this way, what are some mistakes that have been made in the geopolitical uh, environment of the region that has caused Iran to be perceived this way. And that gives you such a perspective, such an eye-opening perspective. And I was shocked after reading that book, oh, how understood few countries in the region could be, misunderstood mm -hmm. few countries in the region could be. So yeah, refer to the experts, refer to the books, refer to their articles, refer to their personal social media, despite I'm not discouraging to get your news sources from regular outlets Do refer to them because they're current they're according to the trends in the market, but get an additional perspective if you really want to come out of that one-sided narrative that you have been fed into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree 100%. To mm -hmm. transition into something very lighthearted and not as sure. uh, not as vasaledar as India-Pakistan okay. relationships, <laughs> yeah. you mentioned your love for horses um, at the start yeah. of the podcast. Uh, what are, or do you remember your first memory of what got you to fall in love with horses? Um, so I think it was uh, Karachi is a city on the southern coast of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. so I was very young at that time. And uh, when you go to the beach, uh, you know, obviously people are swimming over there. People are just having picnic, like, uh, enjoying their snacks. <laughs> but they also have some kind of recreational activities over there on the beach for you. One of them was horse riding, you know? Mm -hmm. So you get to ride a horse on the beach sand with water on, on one side of your view and you know, the coast on the other side of your view. Uh, how old was I? I think I was eight or nine years old. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to ride it. I was like, sure. So I started riding that horse and the way it started to gallop uh, and, you know, the way it set its foot on that sand, it was so soft. I was enjoying it so much. And, uh, the, you know, that that rush of air onto my face, it just all was so uh, delightful that ever since then, I fell in love with that feeling, you know, of being on a horse. Mm -hmm. So I didn't continue riding horses till then, but then I shift, moved into a neighborhood that had a horse riding club next to it. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I'll be very honest with you. I was not very, uh, I was still, at this point, I was still not a big fan of horses. But then this uh, one uh, friend of mine, uh, she was very uh, pretty. She was very attractive. And I think we had a very good chemistry. Uh -huh. She used to go ride horses. Okay. <laughs> and this so is was, in Pakistan, right? You said? This, this is in Pakistan. So uh -huh. I was like, oh, it's a very good opportunity for me to be able to go there and have a conversation with her. So I knew nothing about horses. So I started learning more about horses. Uh, in my efforts to try and impress her, I got on a horse and while she was riding, I, I galloped past her and I fell off my horse. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> so, you <see. laughs> so you see, that's a, that's another motivation for me to be able to bring perfection to my riding skills. Right. But it started from there. Mm. But eventually after that, I fell in love more with the horses than the lady that got me into this, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, the girl left, but the horse stayed. It stayed. I think that that's forever. Yeah. So <laughs> beautiful. Been, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, it's been seven years, but I've been riding horses. Well, yeah, I do know that uh, when you're usually over here in Edmond too, you find your way to get to ride a horse, right? Like, what is it? Do you think that it gives you or it benefits your mental health in some way? It does. It really does. If you're doing things that you really enjoy, you really yeah. love doing, I think it clears out your mind. Mm. It gives you a breathing space. It gives you a space to be in your own zone for some time and then to be able to better take on the challenges of the day. Like I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning and uh, I had my cup of coffee and then we went out uh, to the riding club near me. And uh, mm. I'll tell you what, the the situation on the road today was terrible. There was absolutely zero visibility at 5 a.m. in the morning because there's a lot of fog in the city today. As you can see around me, there's still fog. Usually it's supposed yeah. to be sunny. You can see out through these windows. Yeah. But it's so foggy. There's zero visibility. But I think it's just the love of horses that keeps me going. So even in that zero visibility, a five-minute route took us 30 minutes to drive there. Oh, but wow. we went there because we went there because I think it's uh, it's necessary. It's necessary to clear your mind. It's necessary to do things that you absolutely love in life. Mm-hmm. It really helps. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's really beautiful. Yeah, I think I think the overarching theme over there is that, you know, you need to do the things that you like doing because at the end of the day, those are things that give you that true sense of happiness because you can't necessarily rely on uh, other people to make you happy, you know. I mean, this is something we spoke about, I think, in a, in one of the yeah, episodes I've already open. recorded. Yeah. yeah. So you I have... I would have been able to give a, a better podcast if I hadn't been writing this morning, I'll tell you. I'm in a I appreciate that. Th- I'm, yeah. I'm grateful to that horse that you <laughs> rode on because yeah. you had a great conversation. So I'm not saying that I would be a very terrible interview, but I'm no, just I... saying that <laughs> enhanced my mood to be able to have a more pleasant conversation now. Yeah, 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 totally, totally, yeah. totally. That's good. That's good. That's great. Doesn't that happen to you when you do things that you really enjoy doing? Oh yeah, and then for sure. go around interact with people. You're just in a better mood than everybody else, you know. For sure, for sure, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the beauty of life, you know, like seeking those things that make you happy are yeah. sort of a way to keep yourself sane. So, yeah, that's so that's really writing, writing. Do you think riding horses would make you happy? For me, <laughs> well, I can't remember if I've actually ridden a horse. I've probably ridden a camel once uh, when I was in the UAE and I liked it. But I think camels and horses are very different, like in terms of the feeling that you get when you're riding them, because camels are very slow. It's sort of like a slow burn uh, pace of walking whereas with horses i think like if you were galloping in an open in an open area i think that would just um there's something else to it and um i think i would enjoy it i think i would like if i was to sort of just sit there and be in the moment and sort of enjoy the enjoy the air that's brushing against me yeah i think i would yeah. i think i would like it yeah for sure it's a it's a you know for the love of horses i'm just trying to sell the horse <laughs> <laughs> to your audience you know i think everybody should sit on that saddle and enjoy that galloping horse mm-hmm. and the air yeah gusting through your for once in their life at least there's nothing more there's nothing of feeling more pleasant than that i can assure you that Beautiful. if anybody tries that i think yeah. they should let you know after this podcast oh yeah for that sure really worked for them for yeah. sure like <laughs> yeah if there's anything you want to take yeah. out of this podcast, even if you don't want to talk, like look at the India Pakistan things that we talked about, go and have an experience of riding a horse. Maybe that's something that I should do personally. Maybe some yeah. of you people who are listening or watching watching should do it too. And if you do it, <laughs> you should mention it on the comments down below or you know very very like on the social media channels. <laughs> but that's really yeah. beautiful. I think you know there's there's the the novelty associated with that experience itself. I think is very can be very enriching, even if you haven't, even if I haven't yeah. done it, or if anybody who's listening or watching hasn't done it. I think the novelty associated with it and like that experience that you're gonna have in itself is very enriching if you're in that moment and sort of enjoying the experience. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. transitioning into uh, the latter stage of this podcast, uh, we're gonna walk into the segment called uh, Bish Bash Bosh. 
And the name sounds funny, but basically the the aim of this segment is for you to respond in three words or three phrases mm-hmm. to the five words that I give you. Um, these five words are going to be consistent with everybody that I speak to. So it's just a way from it's just a way to see how people respond to these prompts differently. So uh, I'll give I'll be giving you five mm-hmm. words, like I said, and you'd have to respond to them in three words or in three prompts. Whatever that comes to your mind first. uh it can be very mundane it can be very simplistic or it can be very sophisticated but it's three prompts or three things that come to your mind you ready to go yeah okay all right the first word is differences <laughs> <nervous>. <laughs> nothing to be nervous about the first word is differences differences mm-hmm. differences love acceptance and tolerance beautiful i love that uh the second word is nuance nuances uh that's the only word that comes to my mind saying that nuances is nuances i don't know why <laughs> okay. no i'll take it i'll take it i'll take it i'll take yeah. it uh the third word is learning learning uh inspiring growth mm-hmm. beautiful these are three words that come to my mind mm. yeah wow uh yeah. the fourth word is empathy empathy uh courage the first word that came to my mind i think empathy requires a lot of courage mm-hmm. yeah again love comes to my mind mm. friendship comes to my mind uh, perspectives come to my mind i don't know why beautiful beautiful yeah, yeah. i like the fact that you said courage because i think it takes a sense of courage to swallow your own pride and sort of understand and empathize with other people so yeah i really like that answer uh the last word for the segment is uh, similarities what comes to your mind when i say the word similarities similarities differences okay um because in order to be able to accept someone's similarities i think it's very important to accept someone's differences mm-hmm. that's the first word um wow my mind This is thank you this is actually the first time my mind went blank you know? <laughs> it's like okay. it no way like then again tolerance came to my mind okay mhm yeah gotcha beautiful yes. i think that's a great way to end this segment of the podcast uh so transitioning into the last leg uh the final mm-hmm. two questions of this episode um mm-hmm. what do you think i mean this is something we've already probably talked about because of the the conversation was mostly about communication um mm-hmm. so for you what do you think uh one can do to sort of be relatable or what can you do to be relatable to someone who doesn't believe in the same principles as you or who doesn't necessarily uh do the same things that you do like for example how would you find yourself to be relatable with someone who doesn't ride a horse like <laughs> you know what whatever it is like how would yeah. you relate to someone um you know i sort of have a slightly different perspective to that um, okay someone who is uh not similar to me i think is the best way for me to be able to connect with them mm-hmm. uh our similarities while might be able to put us in the same line together it might but it's not a necessary prerequisite for us to be able to connect with each other oh yeah you know uh you truly become accepting of someone Mm. when you start seeing beyond the similarities that you have when you start to notice those differences between yourselves you know and when you start to accept those differences between each other that's when you truly start to unconditionally extend your friendship towards someone because now when i unconditionally accept extend my friendship towards you i am saying that i accept and i i accept all your views i ex- and uh i have welcomed you with open arms and i think that's the best way to be able to connect with somebody mhm uh, yeah you don't have to necessarily relate with someone to be able to connect with them i think a few opening questions would really help hi how are you how are you doing mm-hmm. what do you do what would you like to do 
know, and I think that starts up a conversation and it's, it's always helpful if it dives into different uh, areas of life, because you know, I think it would be boring to have a conversation with someone who is exactly like me. Mm-hmm. It's so predictable. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Cause uh, I think sometimes when we try to seek that sense of being relatable, we end up yeah. falling in that column of just talking about the same thing that we like instead of mm-hmm. sort of experiencing the differences. So I really like your answer. I really appreciate the fact that you gave that answer. So thank you for saying that. Um, for Yeah. For the last question of this episode. Very yes, simple. Sir. Very simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were to leave our audience today with one positive quote or one positive thought or just one positive experience, um, share that with the world or share that with the audience for that matter. No, you just put me in the spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But whatever, whatever you feel like sharing, something that's positive, a good way to close us off for today. Uh, I think live and let live. Mm-hmm. And uh, it might sound like a simple sentence, but it incorporates a lot of things. Uh, love one another, love your neighbor, mm. uh, love yourself, love your family, love your friends. And when I say love, it's not like, oh, you're so nice to me, so I'm going to start loving you today. Yeah, It's conditional. Love is unconditional. When you love someone, you do not say, oh, I love you for all the good things that you've done for me. Mm. It's, uh, we never say, I love you for all the good things you've done to me, minus all your negative attitudes. Mm-hmm comes with acceptance of one another. I think if even if it's a small step, starting with yourself, accepting others, I think we're going to be able to introduce the values of tolerance and kindness into our society. And I think a small step from your home can go a long way. And if we start doing that, I think we would be able to take these many steps towards the greater peace of mind and the peace of world that we're trying to achieve. Mm. So that's what I'd say. Love one another. Love your neighbor. Unconditionally. Unconditionally is the word. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Accepting live. Accepting uh, of others. Live and let live. Live and let live. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. I think that's a great way to close us off for this episode. So thank you so much, Hazik. I really appreciate you waking up in the morning and doing this. No uh, thank you so much for joining me. One. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I... Last one too. I'm sorry, say that again. I couldn't catch you. I have one last one too for your audience. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, ride horses. That's it. (laughs) Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And on that note, uh, thank you so much everybody for listening and uh, watching. Yeah, it's it's great. I think this is a great initiative. You should keep doing that more often. When I first was wanting to be a part of this podcast, you said that I was asking you if there's going to be any prompts that we're going to be following. But no, uh, there was no prompts. This conversation was so casual. Uh, nothing is scripted just so your audience should know. <laughs> it's so important just having these random conversations with people. I think that's so important. And that's how we can connect with each other. It was just so wonderful. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much, Hazik. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying that, brother. Thank you. And on that note, thank you so much, everybody, for listening and watching. Take care. Thank you for watching this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik. Make sure to follow Hasek on his social media accounts and mention in the comment section below some of your thoughts after listening to this episode and some of the topics that you could relate to. Make sure to like this video, share it around and subscribe to the channel and follow Random Relatability on all social media accounts. Also make sure to check the description box below for other information and content information that we've shared and we've spoken about today. Once again, thank you for joining in on the conversation and listening so far. Stay safe, take care and don't forget to keep your mind open to different perspectives because you never know. Random relatability might just be around the corner.